Uh, good evening, viewers. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today in a, a live stream. Uh, today, we are hosting a second episode of Accountancy as a Career or uh, Introduction to Accountancy. Um, before I start our regular um, uh, show to, uh, tonight, the live stream, I would say, um, I would uh, like to discuss a couple of things um, which are uh, very important here uh, for me, as a matter of fact, as being a father of a child there. Uh, as you might be aware, if you are in a United Kingdom and Ireland, and uh, that uh, uh, the A-level result or a living uh, set results were announced um, a while ago there, um, a couple of weeks ago, and then um, uh, for the living side in Ireland a couple of days ago. And the students were expecting um, a good grades, including uh, my daughter, uh, who has been studying in a private institute, um, uh, Institute of Education um, in uh, Dublin, Ireland, and there. And uh, the results uh, were not uh, as per their expectations. So I was uh, being a, a you know trainer and in, uh, into the education field for the number of years there. I did a little bit of a research there. Uh, I found her very disturbing in last couple of days there because the marks or the grades she was looking uh, to get um, uh, were not achieved by her. The reason, of course, uh, as we know, that there were no uh, physical examination, whether of an A-level or whether of a living cert uh, this year, and it was all, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, result uh, compiled uh, by the tutors and then uh, the, or the past uh, performance um, in the mock exam, and there were other factors involved, and it was a cumulative result there. And, the, and, and then it happened uh, very uh, quickly that uh, the whole formula uh, was not uh, very evident uh, or prominent there in the way that uh, uh, the student didn't knew what to expect. And uh, a day before announcing the result, uh, especially I'm talking about the living side in Ireland, uh, it, it was uh, it, 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 it was indicated by the minister for the fact that 17% of the grade were down, uh, downsized. Uh, I don't know what was the reason behind it, uh, why they were downsized uh, for, uh, for a couple of uh, percentage of the students there. Anyhow, uh, she got um, uh, first choice there uh, in the law there. I'm quite happy with that. But just wanted to share a thought about it, that uh, this pandemic, uh, it, it itself has created a lot of a, a, a uncertainty, especially in the mind of the young uh, students there who are going to start their university lives or their uh, undergraduate uh, life or postgraduate life, either case, whatever it would be. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we'll take a couple of uh, 30 seconds of a quick commercial and then I'll come back there and uh, we have our our instructor, Rahat uh, Kazmi, um, in the studio, who will be going through uh, the principle of accounting, uh, which is the part two of three parts uh, series there. Uh, I, I will be back then in the show, just a small commercial break there. Okay, welcome back. Um, let's start our uh, regular um, live stream there with uh, Rahat Kazmi. Uh, in my episode one, I deduced him um, already and he went through a good uh, number of slides there. If you haven't watched it, I will share the link of this YouTube as well as the Facebook live there. Um, welcome to the stream, Rahat Sahib. Uh, a very warm welcome. Thank you, Dr. Sip. Thank you very much for welcoming and hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the last video and today we'll go into part two. 
just want to give a little brief uh, to see what we did last week. Last week, we basically talked about accounting, what accounting was, what kind of types of accounting were. So we discussed last week uh, accounting. Uh, we discussed bookkeeping. And number two, we discussed financial accounting. So today, we'll be talking about financial accounting and income tax accounting. These are basically the sec uh, no, number three and four in part two. So uh, I just want to get my screen on, if I can. Yeah, hold on. One second. Um, you have, uh, did you send me that? I have to. No, I think I can select, I can select a thing myself. No? Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's put this back into where. Okay. Uh, if you please get the screen there, no? Yeah. Okay. Should we start? Yeah, just give me one second. Sure. Let me organize in a way that it's. Yes, go ahead, please. Excellent. Okay. okay, so episode two, guys. And first of all, uh, number three, you know, as I said, we talked last week, we talked about uh, bookkeeping. Number two was uh, financial accounting, and today we'll talk about manage, uh, managerial accounting. Last week, we discussed slightly what managerial accounting was, and this was basically uh, information which we prepare only for insiders, people who are inside the company. Managerial accounting and financial accounting and income tax accounting, they're all three different set of accounting, but they're all based on one single platform of bookkeeping. So bookkeeping is the first step where we collect data, we organize the data, and then this data is organized and, and distributed into financial accounting or managerial accounting. So if someone who didn't attend last, last week's session, so managerial accounting was, financial accounting was, for example, information which you prepare and share with people on outside the company. These would be investors, these would be uh, shareholders, or other general people, people who have some influence or some sort of interest in the company. Managerial accounting basically was uh, data which is raw data. It's very detailed. It's not in summary, as we had the financial accounting data. So this is also very secretive. When we think about managerial accounting, we should think about few things. First of all, it's insight, and it's detailed. Then it's secretive. It's secretive in such a way, such a way that it's not shared with everyone even inside the company. It's on need to know basis. Because for example, let's say one person is doing uh, payroll. The payroll officer or payroll manager will not be able to share the wages people get uh, the salaries people get to every colleague he has, it can only be shared with head of department or maybe the GM or the CFO, CEO. They can see what everyone gets. They can sign because they have to sign it off. So this information will be very, very confidential. So managerial accounting is, is prepared in detail. You know, it's intensive. It's used on a daily basis. Every single day we use managerial accounts uh, to make decisions. So basically, uh, Managerial accounting can help us make the scene in business. For example, if we are running uh, a car sale company, we have a car garage. So from managerial accounting reports, we can see exactly which uh, cars are selling more because we can see the sales going up and down. We can make the scene from there, should we sell sports cars? Or should we go into family cars? Or should we sell cars which are first-time buyers, small cars, small engine cars, which cars are selling more? Or if we're running an ice cream factory or ice cream shop, from ice cream shop figures of sales we got, you know, we can see exactly which ice creams have sold more. Should we be selling more strawberry ice cream or vanilla ice cream? This will help. If our office or business has multi, multiple regions, so we can say which region is more profitable. If one region is busy, really busy, and other region, regions are in demand, so we can open maybe another office in Leeds or Birmingham, or maybe in, in Glasgow, in, in Scotland. So this, this is how, 
just this information will help us. So a lot of people will be afraid of the idea, thinking magical quanting would be so complex, but in my opinion, most of us, no matter where we have worked, we have worked in our, our own company or a smaller company or even in charity company. We all have been involved in magical quanting one way or other. So people will ask question, oh, oh I didn't get involved, I didn't work in accounts. No, no, it's not to work in accounts basically because we collect data. Bookkeeping job is to collect data. Then we organize the data. Then this data, when it's organized, then it's basically recorded and and sent to bankruptcy reports and financial reports and bookkeeping, you know, other reports as well. So this, this is how everyone has been involved. Are they collecting data or maybe organizing data in one way or other? So medical quantity data is designed to share with outsiders of the company who will be sort of thinking, is this company worth investing in future? Uh, is the company's growth going up and down? Is growth is going upwards? And of course, they will be trying to invest money in, in, you know, in the business. They like to be part of the success. If the business was not doing so well, then people who are in the business as well, they like to sell the shares and walk away from it. Yeah, this is how this information is used. So in, interesting fact about mental accounting is if it's used properly, this can be used as a competitive tool. Okay, so this can really take your company ahead. It can give your company a competitive edge as compared to competitors in the marketplace. Okay, because it can also tell us, you know, not only that income we're going to get, our income we're making, it also can tell us how much cost will cost us to run the business, to run the company. Yeah. To explain the competitive tool a uh, bit of uh, magical accounting, I'll just go through uh, one example here. Let's imagine we've got two grocery stores, grocery store number one and grocery store number two. These both stores are, let's say, in the same street, opposite each other. So accessibility to get there, you know, either by car, by train, etc., by walking, is exactly the same. They got same locations. But arguments say, let's say when we go inside, we find exactly the same kind of infrastructure, the shelving, the ambience, you know, the store, the, the stock. They buy from similar suppliers, so they got same quality of, of, of food available to sell. Uh, so there's nothing different from each other apart from, you know, uh, when we come to that is uh, the bookkeeping style. Grocery store number one offers a very traditional bookkeeping. That basically means that they are only interested in paying the bills, paying the suppliers, and basically paying their paying the stuff, that's all. But on the other hand, grocery store number two, they like to keep the track, they like to keep the data track. They like to make sure that whatever they're doing, they keep an eye on that. For example, they would be using ABC, or what you call it, ABC casting or activity-based casting. That every single activity takes place, transaction takes place, Every single thing they buy from a supplier. So when this item leaves from the supplier and goes to delivery delivery process and come to the loading bay, they know exactly how much it costs. The actual basic basic price of it, delivery cost, and the manhandling process and all that when it goes to storage, they know exactly how much each and every item they have is going to cost them. Because they got really sophisticated accounting system, they can keep track of the sales on each day. For example, they they will know how much they sold at 12 p.m or 5 p.m. this evening, or 8 p.m. this evening. So they can keep track. Plus, uh, they would have a loyalty card system like we have Tesco's, you know, if you go to Tesco's, Tesco's offer a Tesco club card system. So when you go to checkout, you offer your club card to scan your points there, how much, how much you spend. So every, as Tesco, their logo, they, they know their mission statement is every little helps. So every time we scan our, our Tesco club card, it sort of gives us some points. So interestingly, Tesco points, they are really good, you know, because uh, I once needed some insurance and I had lots of Tesco points and that insurance was almost 60% discounted because of Tesco club points. Tesco offer, Tesco points are also used maybe in airlines. Uh, they can be used in hotels and theme parks and stuff, uh, in restaurants. So this company at grocery store number two, they got similarly, similar loyalty cards points. So every time customer checks out, they scan their, uh, their loyalty card, and it gives them an idea of what their spending power is, uh, what age group they are, et cetera. So they can also see from loyalty card how much each person is spending. You know, what the order, every time they come, what they order and what they spend. Okay, so grocery store one, this store basically what they have, they work, 
their accounting is based on like we call it meat and potato style accounting. Very simple. They only want to pay the bills to suppliers and pay the staff wages. They're not bothered about accounting. They just want to make sure the sales are up. They buy from this and that. But the second stores, grocery store number two, their management team knows the managerial accounting is a competitive tool, and they like to use it in the same way. Okay. So this team in, in grocery store number two, their accounting system is sophisticated. And they, they try to get the, gather the data from bookkeeping, and then they organize the data. And this data is used in different functions through managerial accounting. And that's how they get information about their customers, about their costs, and everything. So, grocery store number two staff, they know itemized costs of each and every item they, they buy and sell. Okay, So, they would basically know from the shelves how much uh, each and every item is there. When they need to buy another one, because they would have, you know, an item up to date stock system as well. Every time something sells from this from the till, it sends the information to the warehouse, you know, or maybe the stock room that these items are less known. So they know when to order the next next one in line. So because of the activity based costing, they can offer customers 20 to 30 percent discount because they know exactly how much they can sell each item after even you know making some profits. So because if you don't know how much how much is going to cost you, you can't really Think of how much profit you can make. So this will help them. This helps them basically to make sure they keep track of their the cost and they can still make profit, but also keep the customer happy. Okay, uh, they know what people will buy because they have the loyalty points. They offer loyalty points, and customers will give them information uh, in in terms basically against you know getting some points. The customer will give them information on what they're buying on a regular basis. Okay. Uh, so it makes it, it makes easy for them to target promotions for each customer. If one, if let's say Dr. C, if you go for uh, grocery shop, uh, grocery shopping, and you always buy pasteurized milk instead of skim milk, so grocery store two will know that you know Mr. Uh, Mr. C comes in and he always buys pasteurized milk. So they will give you information or you know to, uh, quotations or promotions on on pasteurized milk only. If I go to the same shop and I always buy the vanilla ice cream. They know the vanilla ice cream is my test, my my favorite, so they will send me in promotions as per that. So these systems basically, you know, they can make the company really really clever. It's kind of an artificial intelligence, which helps them a lot. Uh, because the system, the system in grocery store two uh, is very nice. People know, you know, they can basically uh, they know exactly the, the they know how, because of, they know the sales on a daily basis. Uh, how much? Because they will have forecasts of each week. Uh, they know exactly what days of the week are busy, really busy for them. What days are really quiet for them? They can even staff the, the, They can even keep the staff accordingly. Let's say from looking at the UK, you know, or Ireland point of view. And Monday, the shopping centers are usually very, very quiet because everyone goes to work. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday will obviously be quiet. Thursday becomes busier because Thursday evening is a long, you know, long evening, a long day for everyone. And most shops will close at 9 p.m. So they can have extra stuff. Uh, Sunday, Saturday really is very, very busy for every every shop or every business because people are free. Sunday is not always weekend day, but it's not that busy because sometimes people will be worried about going back to work the following day. So if this company, grocery store too, they know that what their busy days are, they can put extra stuff. They can get extra stock as well when it's going to be busy for them. Let's say they sell nine bottles of milk. Uh, big, but four gallon bottle of milk, you no know, on every on every day. But then they, on Saturday, they might be selling twenty five or thirty. So they can stock as per their busy days because the information they get. They can also stuff the stuff uh, the the store as well as per their busy days and quiet days. And they also know the demographics, and these demographics will help them uh, to promote, pro send promotions to to the customers as per their their taste, as per their sort of age group, as per their spending powers. All right, so you know this effort here, uh, trying to basically you know uh, sell the customers you know promotions etc. This might look like maybe we're doing advertising and marketing here, but no, I think if you look carefully, this advertising and marketing stands behind a very good sophisticated bookkeeping system. If we didn't have bookkeeping in place, we would not be able to gather this information in the first place. Okay, so managing the accounting system and the data behind it, it makes it possible for us to target each and every customer we have in a store, right? So another question arises, 
Classic Store 2 was equipped with, with sophisticated recording system, and Classic Store 1 was a simple recording system. So which one would be winner? Which one will be winning more revenue from other? Which which one can get can make more money? Although we thought initially, you know, they both are in the same location, uh, the infrastructure is exactly the same, MBS installed exactly the same, equipment, shelves, everything is exactly the same. But in my opinion, grocery store two will do a lot better because they know the customer really better. They know what customer choices are. They have a lot more information about the customer than grocery store one has. So I think grocery store two will be a winner here. They will be able to use uh, manual recording as a competitive tool. Okay. All right, now next we can discuss you know, how magical accounting data is used. I'll go through a few headings, but also explain every heading with an example. For example, let's talk first of all is uh, product cost. When it comes to product cost, let's say we have a furniture store in our neighborhood. And we know the furniture store owner or shopkeeper there. Let's say one, one day a customer walks into the store. A customer says to shopkeeper, I'd like to get a customized oak table made. Of course, the next step will be for a shopkeeper to give him estimate. If the shopkeeper, you know, can only give us intelligent estimate if he knows exactly how much it's, it's going to cost him, how much the customized table or specifications are going to cost him. If he can define that, he can give a really good reasonable estimate, which can also be acceptable to the customer and is also profitable for him. So that's why I will say product cost is part of is part of managerial accounting. The next one is break-even analysis. Let's say we're opening a beauty shop near our uh, near the shopping center, near, near our home. Uh, before we open the beauty shop, or uh, you know, let's say uh, beauty therapy, we need to understand what the costs are involved. What are the costs involved to open the shop, to rent it, maybe lease it, uh, the equipment to buy for it, and then how much the staff will cost, and the taxation, the you know, the government rates, everything. What's going to cost us every month? Equipment. Raw materials, you know, everything we need to buy inventory. Once we work through all the costs we have, then we need to work out okay, these are the costs for us every month. So we need to sort of see exactly what is what's the selling price for each that's each beauty treatment. We need to also work out how many customers we need to serve to make that kind of, in, that kind of money which will be equal to our expenses. So at this stage, we're not making any profit, we're not making any loss. This is called break-even when we our our revenue equals our expenses. This is break-even analysis, OK? So we need to figure out how many customers would you serve. So we need to do, of course, some calculations, yeah? Calculations of, you know, how much each customer, how much you're going to charge each customer. We need to sell, we need to set a selling price for each treatment. So we need to work out exactly how many treatments we need to do. We can we can set up, like, if we achieved it. Some business can take, you know, longer than others to set up, basically, their break-even analysis. Uh, so see if a friend of mine, uh, not Tasir Qureshi, he, he had actually had left uh, his uh, charter accountancy, but he started his own practice in uh, Wilson Green in London. It took his business, I think, 18 months to break even. And then he's really, really happy because they're doing really great now, but it took 18 months. So it depends on how long it takes. We need to work out exactly uh, how long it'll take us to do our break even. So this break even is also an important part of managerial accounting analysis. Next one is budgeting. Budgeting is very, very crucial part of any business. Most businesses, small businesses fail because they don't do budgeting for themselves. Budgeting basically is a numerical plan on paper. We write down exactly what our income is and how much we're going to spend from that income. And we sort of look at the income first of all, minus all the expenses, and we know exactly how much we left with. If we have not prepared a budget, we will not be able to keep track on where we're going, how much we're spending, how much we have in hand. So this way, you know, most businesses who fail because you know they don't keep budget in hand. So that's why budgeting is also a very important part of managerial accounting. And next one is performance evaluation. Performance evaluation, I think, is done in lots of multinationals. In no matter where you are, even even in India, Pakistan, they will have performance evaluation, or we can call it performance appraisal. So a lot of employers, they would like to see which employees are doing better. So through performance appraisal, they will be able to see, is, is there, are they doing the job properly? Are they really doing much better than others? So should they set up uh, reward everyone at the same place, or should they reward people who are doing a lot better? 
I think common sense says, you know, that they should reward people who are doing a lot better than others, so that other people can be motivated. Uh, you know, performance appraisals, companies, some have, some companies might have schemes like, you know, employee of the month award, or maybe employee of the quarter award, employee of the year award. So when they have employee of the year award, or you know, quarter award, employee of the month award, they would have different sort of rewards for it. Uh, somebody could get some monetary value or 100 pound cash, 200 pound cash. Some might even get a holiday in Caribbean with a spouse on. So with this kind of performance valuation and rewards, staff will be motivated. It'll also motivate other staff as well who are there. So that's why we need to do some calculations, gather some data to evaluate different parts of our business. These are also part of managerial accounting. Next one is investing in long-term projects. Long-term projects, you know, we cannot, we cannot always get 100% figure right, but of course, if we calculate, if we use manual accounting data, we can get very close to it. We can get very close to accuracy. For example, let's say we're going to open a new factory in Oxford, uh, which will last for 25 years because each project, you know, every time we open a factory, factories cannot last forever. You know, in the UK, we have cities like, you know, uh, let's say Leicester, uh, we got uh, Manchester, Birmingham, Huddersfield, uh, Coventry. These all cities were factory cities. When people came from India, Pakistan, uh, people who didn't have education at the time, a lot of education, a lot of people came from Mirpur when the dam was made, in Mangala dam was made. So British government said, just sort of fine, we'll accept these people, let them have, because British companies were making the dam at the time. So a lot of people were given visas to come here and they had no education, so they could only get a job in a factory. So those factories you know, were there, a lot of people got jobs there, but those factories have disappeared now. I can't see any, any of those factories anymore. Manufacturing business in UK is almost finished. It's almost next to none. When I first came here in, in late 80s at that time, we were making lots of cars there, Hondas, you know, Hondais, and you know, BMWs, and Rover, and so and so. But no, most of the plants have gone out, they are gone out of the country, they, none of them is here. Okay, so let's say this factory was going to last for 25 years. We need to make a decision. This decision would require how to use manual accounting information to work with the cost to buy the land, first of all, build the building, to buy the equipment and machinery, the plants for, for the factory, whatever we have. And when we, when we'll make profits, let's see, when will be our break even analysis, break even point there. How long the business will last? All this data will be gathered in order to make a decision. And should we start the business in this location or maybe should we go for a different location? Okay. Next one part of uh, manual accounting data use is you now outsourcing production. Uh, there was a time that a lot of things were made in European countries, but then they realized you know that there are some cheaper markets in the world, so they didn't mind traveling. You know, when a few years ago, uh, I think back in two thousand one, uh, when. I joined uh, Norwich Union. Norwich Union is uh, the, the biggest insurance company in the UK. They are known as Aviva now. They were Norwich Union before. And they were number six in the world at the time. So basically, I was working for uh, Giorgio Armani in, in London and went to work in Norwich Union. In Norwich Union, there were only few foreigners there. And those foreigners were from India. They were, they looked like from other Hyderabad or Ahmedabad, I think. Uh, so I saw eight, nine people in, in the market, in the town center, when I went to eat food. Next day, when I went to work in the office in Aviva, those people were working there as well. They were IT people there. They were, uh, they were doing outsourcing business for Aviva. I can give another example. Let's say some hotels, you know, in, in the early 90s, they all had their uh, laundry rooms in the hotels. That means each time the customer has used their bed sheets, their pillow, their towels, and their handkerchiefs, etc. They were all washed in the hotel. So each hotel will have a big plant to set up, laundry plant. There are like four or five people working there. They will have lots of big trolleys, you know, to put, put dirty laundry in there. And they, they have lots of heat in there. Lots of electricity will be used, lots of gas will be used. And the lots of sheets will be ironed and all that. So they will have lots of stuff working there full time. They have to pay the stuff holidays and everything. They have to pay all the costs as well, buy a new sort of, you know, uh, laundry, then keep washing it, keep ironing it, and sending it back to the rooms. And then I think we had some, some companies who came into business, and these companies realized you know, that they can, they, can make, they can make laundry plants and supply fresh laundry to lots of hotels. Let's say their production capacity was 1,000 
towels. One machine could clean 1,000 towels. So for them to clean one, 100 towels or 1,000 towels, the cost is the same. So what was also realized, you know, that we're getting a lot cheaper from these people instead of, you know, we can close in our laundry room, buy the, buy the stock from them, you know, and rent it, rent it or lease it out. So if, if something goes wrong, you send it back. So your job in, in the hotel will be to put la dirty laundry into bags outside, and this staff, will, this uh, company will send a truck next day. They deliver the fresh laundry, fresh, uh, you know, bed sheets, pillows, pillowcases, etc., flesh towels, and take the dirty ones away. So this was working a lot cheaper for them. So you know, if we have, let's say, a factory in Birmingham, we can see, you know, can we maybe open, you know, other, uh, you know, but can we outsource this in other countries like Bangladesh, India, Thailand, China? where it's going to be cheaper. So we can make this kind of decision through managerial accounting, because when we get information, what's more profitable for us? Is it profitable for us to, to be here, or is it profitable for us to outsource information from somewhere else? Most companies will say these days, they usually outsource their payroll in accounting function, because otherwise you will have to hire, if company is bigger, they need to hire two or three people in the business. You have to pay the wages, they have to pay the holidays, etc. Then you have to buy less equipment. So a company outside the country, they might charge, you know, maybe one tenth of the price of the same payroll cost. So you say all you need to is send them. Yeah, like you were saying, no? sorry to interrupt. Like you were saying about the factories, the cost of production has raised over the period of the time. And when you add up um, the rents, uh, the rates or council taxes in the case of United Kingdom as well as um, uh, the minimum hour uh, wage rates there, and then uh, the direct and indirect cost there. It's quite, uh, 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 you know, profitable to get it from the from the uh, third world countries, especially like uh, in the case of, uh, uh, in the case of uh, Depri or uh, outfits in Bangladesh, India and Pakistan, and the case of electronics, uh, China. Um, same is the case with, I think, so uh, with, with the outsourcing of the services, uh, like you were saying about the wages, uh, the counting packages. There are a lot of firms who will take about 20 clients or 30 clients and then uh, um, uh, all together and will uh, process the wages for the small and medium uh, term, uh, sort of uh, uh, companies there. Of course, no, right. well, then the next one is about adding a product line. So we can see, let's say, to see if you have a factory in, in Dublin and you make uh, children clothes. So from manual quarter, you can also identify, can you also add another line? Can you also maybe start making adult clothes? Should that be women only? Or should that be more women and men, men clothes as well? This can all be done, you know, through some calculation of figures, you know, here and there. Get info data from other competitors who are doing adult clothing and see, is it profitable in this area? Is this area good for this kind of clothes? Or do we have lots of families living here? If families living there, there'll be adults in the house, also kids in the house. If it's only you know schools nearby, then we need to sell more uniforms. So this kind of information can all be achieved through medical accounting. All right. Okay. Uh, next topic is accounting setup books. Usually, multinationals they will have different setup books. The setup books basically they sort of range from two to five setup books. I mean, I'm not going to say, you know, that we, I'm talking about as cooking the books. Cooking books will be totally illegal. Although I still remember when I worked in a different country before I came to UK, uh, a third world country, that's the, where, you know, we had, we had different set of books in, in meaning, literally we had different set of books. One set of books was for owners, and one set of books was for the government, which we had to report. Basically, let's say the hotels, you know, uh, we had triple rooms and double rooms and suites. So every, pers every time you have restaurant uh, business as well, Restaurant will have to pay uh, sales tax per person served in the restaurant, per person stayed in the hotel bedroom. So in the triple room, they will show to government single occupancy, but they sell triple occupancy. Triple occupancy will go uh, to to the owners, how much money they actually made, and single occupancy will go to the government, you know, how much how much money they were supposed to make in in sort of in terms. I'm not saying you know that in West everything is perfect. It's not perfect, but it's not as bad as some several countries. Here, you know, sort of here also there's some, you know, uh, some some things are out of order practice here, but you know, here most mostly things are in the in the, in the loop here. Okay, in fact, large organizations will use three set of books, generally speaking. But all these three set of books, they are based basically on bookkeeping system. 
because bookkeeping system collects all the data, and then this data is actually used to to make this set of these set of books. You know, it could be first set of books will be financial uh, reporting books. Financial set of books. These set of books are prepared, are designed in such a way that information should be given to people outside the business. These are potential investors, or even suppliers. You know, these people they like to keep an eye on us. You know, make sure that we are still in in good health of business. Business is profitable, is growing. Okay, all right. And the second set of uh, books will be second set of books is about you know what call it uh, tax reports. Tax reporting is basically for uh, government people, government only. You know we can see government government can see from our our figures how much money we made and how much we need to pay them. So this is only to comply with the law, law compliance only. The purpose of two different reporting, for example. Uh, financial reporting was uh, for people outside the business. We had we had declared some kind of income, which that income is not going to be the same as tax income. Tax income will usually be very different because let's say we in a business we made half a million pound last year, and half a million pound was was sort of you know let's say uh, reported in financial reporting, uh, financial accounting that we made half a million pound, five hundred thousand pounds in a year. But then we we didn't take into account some uh, bad debts in accounts. Some companies will be new companies in business. They, we give them some credit to pay us back later on. We send invoices, but they fail to pay us. If they fail to pay us, that means you know we could lose twenty to thirty thousand pounds in the year because you know that that money will never come back to us. So we cannot report. We can only report taxable income, a taxable reporting you now, which is actual income, actual money which which we can receive, not the one which can. Uh, sort of you know focus and see that we're going to make. That's why the two different set of books, but they have different purposes. We cannot report exactly the same financial accounting income which we thought initially. Uh, okay, so let's see. Financial reports are prepared to give economic information to potential lenders or investors. That's their purpose. Yeah, that's their purpose is to give investors information that we are healthy in business, we're growing, we keep making profits. Uh, at the same time, tax reports are merely designed to satisfy the law, satisfy the government, you know, that we are there, we're making money, and they can expect certain amount of money every time, you know. That's why we send, uh, you know, our tax returns, or, you know, VAT returns, VAT returns or VAT returns. Because VAT, when you send VAT returns, government, government knows that these are VAT returns, and then we can pay them later on. So VAT returns are submitted. We don't have to send money straight away. We can send, submit VAT returns, but pay the money when we actually collect the rent, uh, collect the money. So there are two different purposes for two different sets of books, for example, you know. The third set of book is internal managerial reports, which is different to other tax accounting or financial accounting. Okay, now this is the fourth point, which will be the last topic for today. Basically, this is income tax reporting. Last week we discussed book bookkeeping and we talked about financial reporting. And today we talk about managerial accounting. And just the fourth topic now is income tax reporting. You should look in the picture here and diagram there. Uh, on the top, we got four different sets of you know uh, of income there. First of all, is income uh, economic income. Then we got accounting income. Then on the right hand side, we got taxable income. And finally, on the right side, we got the cash flow. Under the economic income, there's a cross there. Under the cross, we got two bullet points: value changes, and we got subjective. Under accounting income, we got under the cross accruals. And tax income, we got under the class reduce arguments, ability to pay, and social tinkering. Under cash flow uh, class, we have objective and cash flow. I'll go through all of them one by one. I just want to tech paste the diagram so people can remember the diagram. I'll be referring back to it in, in sort of meanwhile when we explain everything. So let's take the first one, which is economic income. Economic income is based on the value changes. How much we are worth, how much the business is worth, how much my car is worth, how much my house is worth. You know, in our Asian communities, as if you will agree that another way we keep assessing each other. When some when some guests come to our house for the first time, we like to look at this car. What car is it driving? Okay, what's the model of the car? Does a leather seat, a set nav, or something? And sometimes, if you're too too curious, you might even ask them, "What year is your car? What's the mileage to get exact information?" And if we go to someone's home, we ask them, "Is this house semi-detached? Is this is a detached house? How many bedrooms do we have? We know exactly what area they live in. We can assess." We can estimate, you know, what's what's the worth of the house, how much this person is worth, you know, altogether. Similarly, for a business, economic income can sort of work out the worth of a business. 
which is very subjective. It is it's subjective because of economic conditions. Sometimes, uh, let's say the value changes, uh, you know, of the house. Sometimes inflation rate goes up and down. Sometimes, uh, you know, exchange rate goes up and down. I had bought a plot in Barrier Town, Islamabad, uh, in 2007. So a few years ago, it was it was doing I think 50 lakh rupees. Uh, and then I think no has gone down. But no, if okay, I might say it didn't it didn't lose a lot of value in rupees. But if you, if I compare with pounds, no, I've lost lots of value because no no one pound equals 220, 220 rupees. So basically, if you look at that, it's not really that much worse as it was before. So economic income is is subjective. Uh, it's it's there as a guideline, like like a budget we have. Okay, so it can really guide us in in certain way, uh, but it's very subjective. Next one is accounting income, which is on the right hand side from uh, economic income. Agnomic, ag accounting income basically is in between taxable income. Uh, so according, accounting income and taxable income are in between economic income and cash flow. Cash flow is on the right hand side, and accounting uh, tax uh, sorry in Accounting income, or no, sorry, economic income is left hand side. So let's start the diagram again. Try to, uh, you know, sort of imagine we have economic income, then we've got taxable income, then we got tax, no, taxable income, and we've got uh, a cash flow. So accounting income is in uh, in between, accounting tax income are in between economic income and cash flow. Accounting income basically will try its best to make sure it reaches as close to the economic income. Because we get a forecast, we get a budget, how much money we're going to make. So basically, we need to make sure we work very hard to produce that, that kind of income. And when we talk about accounting income, this is all based on accrual system. We don't always get exact information. Let's take an example of uh, utility bills. Like UK and Ireland as well, utility bills are not sent every month. They send every second month. So let's say we're running a business on, on calendar basis, yearly basis. That means for gas, electricity. We only get six bills, not not twelve bills. So let's say we're doing uh, February accounting in month of March. In early March, we start doing accounts. So we only got bill of bill the month of February, which is for two months basically. But we didn't post anything in January, month of January. So if we don't post all the bills in each month when the bill was supposed to arrive but didn't arrive, it arrives the second day. Our profit and loss figure will be up and down. It'll be just fluctuating up and down. And companies prefer straight line. Income report, you know, they like to see exactly income should be in straight line, it should not be up and down. That's why we post some uh, expenses. Let's say for gas, everything gas bill was 400 pound in month of February. Last year, month of February was 400 pound for two months, and then we know roughly estimated it's about 200 pound per month. We might think, okay, maybe it could be maybe 190, um, it could be 220 because January was still very cold. So we can post approximate expenses which are called accru accrual expenses. So when actual bill comes, we only reverse the month of January because that month we didn't know, we didn't get the right bill. We reverse that and post actual bill. So this, in this stage, month to date bill will be exactly fine. We're not posting more money there. We're only posting what, were, what really happened. So similarly, accounting income as well, which is which, which comes to accrual, accrual income, we keep recording in such a way that you know, we don't sort of go above it, okay? Uh, let me give you an example of you know how it works really when we when we say accrual income. Okay, let's say my business is called soft skill experts. You know, soft skill experts. I do training in Middle East, Europe, uh, in UK. So basically, let's say from that source only, I would have made let's say forty five thousand pound last year. But I don't get cash in hand. You know, always when finish training, finish after five days. Okay. They don't give me cash. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kazmi. You came there. Here's the money for five years. There you go. Bye bye. I send them invoice when I can't get back here. They look invoice, they check everything, what the quotation was initially, what we agreed on daily daily rate. And then invoice is it goes to their finance department, it approves up, then they send payment in maybe let's say months, two months, three months. Sometimes some companies take even longer. Let's say for argument's sake, you know, I made money this year. I had the revenue this month, this year, but I didn't collect the money this year. Money came to me the following year. So should we report the income when it comes to income tax reporting? This year, I should we report income tax reporting the following year? The right answer would be, we should only report the taxable income, income tax reporting, when we get the money in hand, not when we have accrued the income. Okay, when we have uh, accounting income, basically, 
income accounting idea of accounting income is accrual income is not to follow the cash but to follow the money follow the effort follow the creation of income income economic value so when when we talk about accounting income we had to report it when when the uh, transition has taken place let's say i delivered a, a training course in 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 oman i went to sohar uh, after five days i created invoice invoice was sent to them invoice actually was also created in my sis in my accounting system so that revenue was generated that revenue i have earned that revenue i have not earned the money yet but i have earned the revenue so when it comes to accounting income this income has gone there but it, it hasn't gone still into taxable income in, taxable income will be only achieved when i get the money for it yeah i think it'll be more clear when you know of course when they look at the video once or twice you know go through slides again they will understand what i'm talking about it might be a bit harder I think last week was a lot easier to understand, but this one we're getting into more sort of nitty gritty, you know, going to deeper and slowly. Okay. Uh, all right. So basically, just to go through the same example, you know, accounting records, financial accounting, for example, report the income tax this year uh, when we actually did the work. This marks towards the economic side of the things, you know, when, when we did the work, because accounting income is close to the economic income. So if we, it's very subjective. If we don't get all the money, if I didn't get the training fees all, all together, let's say I did two training courses for them in one month, they only paid me for one. And when before before they could pay the second one, uh, company went out of business. That means I cannot report that income to taxable uh, income because you know, I didn't get all the income, income back. But when as far as it's concerned in account, accounting income is there because transaction has taken place, then it would be adjusted. Before we do over year end, it will be adjusted definitely. Then we had to actually report what we really got some money. But on the other hand, did we create the value this year? That's just when we are going to report the income. Value was created. That value will be reported into accounting income, but it will be only reported into taxable income when money is received. Okay, next one is taxable income. On the other hand, taxable income is towards the cash flow side. You know, when we look at the picture again, we had economic income first, then we had taxable income, then we had taxable income. So, sorry, let's start again. We had economic income, accounting income, taxable income, then cash flow. So, taxable income is very close to cash flow. That means if it was a cash flow, under cash flow, under cross, we had a bullet point called objective. But on the economic income, we had bullet point called subjective. Why I would say taxable income will be more objective? Because when we receive the cash, Cash is physical in our hand or in our bank accounts. We can see it's become tangible. We can see it. We can feel it. We can spend it. So we should only pay the tax when we have the money. Even the governments are very sort of flexible. They will not ask you to pay the tax as soon as you have the income, as soon as you declare income. They will only give you time up to a year, sometimes more than a year as well. If you're late, you pay a little penalty, but you still pay taxes after a year when you have to receive the money actually. So at that time, if some money has not come through, some money has diverted, you report accordingly that this money we didn't receive it, okay? And then, of course, you know. But at the end of the day, we need to obey the law. We need to follow the law. We need to pay as much we owe. And by measuring subjective economic value, it's hard to tell who's right or wrong because you know, if we are talking about accounting income here, which is close to sort of you know economic income, is subjective. So we cannot see how much money we're going to get, although we had revenue there. You know, I work for uh, a facility management company in Dublin to see if it was their base in close to Dublin too. Uh, so when I went to work for them as financial controller, they had uh, lots of work in progress. Work, work in progress basically is like, you know, they had income there, which which which, which was reported there. This is our income. This was showing as, as you know, their, if you look at the balance sheet, it was showing the balance sheet as uh, what's called a cost receivable. They're going to recover it. So I kept selling, telling, look, guys, I need to see this income. Where the income is? Where's the proof? Where's the invoices? And they couldn't show me. They said, well, it's there, it's there, but no one was prepared to show it. I keep saying to them, look, guys, if you don't prove it to me, that means then I, I'm not going to believe it. Neither the taxman will believe it. Neither the you know, of your uh, investor will believe it. Because they had lots of tax uh, income, which was showing as work in progress, which is showing, you know, as uh, accounts receivable, but it was, there was no proof behind it. So eventually the company, you know, they had receivers come in, walk in there, and company went into liquidation because they could not, they were, they said maybe they in, they were inflating the income. They Maybe they had done it. Maybe, you know, in, in, in Ireland at that time, maybe things have changed. Everything was, you know, done 
in the head. Uh, paper book was, was non-existent. No thing was done. Was done. Okay, I know this guy. I know this guy, and then nothing was recorded. So I think that could be very dangerous if we don't sort of keep proper measures. But whereas the cash flow is straightforward, you know, it reduces arguments. We have the money. Where's the money? In my pocket. Okay, you know what they say? Show me the money. <laughs> Where's the money? Show me the money. When we can show the money, it's all in black and white. Okay, so basically, it's easier to obey the law because when we have the money, it's all in black and white. We can show from taxable income, money is there. Here's the money. Is this what we got? And this is what we're going to pay. So when taxable, when tax inspector comes to see the place, they can see, yes, this was the money. They, money, they see the money, this one, this was the taxable income, and that's what they paid for it. So depending on you know, the taxable tax rates, for example, Ireland was cheapest in corporation taxes. That's why a lot Still of companies. Steady, steady, steady. But yes. the, uh, I think it was 12 and a half percent. Is it still the same price? It's still the same there in the it's cheapest in EU. Cheapest EU. So that's why lots of companies they would have you know working, they'll be working like you know, Amazon or eBay or everybody else will be working all over Europe. Mm -hmm. But they flush their income through Ireland to save the taxes because some countries charge 40 percent corporation tax. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I earn the income this year, but I can't pay the tax until I'm able to collect the cash. That's that's especially tax income is is all about. It's logical to wait till the next year, pay the tax when I have collected the cash. This is another way of, of idea behind uh, taxable income. You know, we, we only pay when we get the money. So next one is the bullet point which we had under uh, the taxable income was social tinkering. Tinkering basically, I, I, I suppose, means, you know, when we do bits and pieces of things you know, at a time, instead of doing all in one go, we do a little bit of pieces and we get the work done. It makes the tax rules more complex in many countries. Why? Because, you know, let's say uh, somebody owns a house on mortgage. When you have the mortgage, you get some tax relief. So you need to tell the inland revenue or revenue house or tax inspectors, I have I have a mortgage, and they will give you a new tax code. And the tax code will basically, the new tax code will save you some money. It will get you some relief of income or some tax reduction in your tax because you have a mortgage. Because the government still encourage people to buy their own homes. Similarly, when a company will invest in charity, when a company will invest some community projects, what happens when we have a business to, to see if we, we make money from the community? We sell our products and services to the community. Yeah. But if we give something back in return for some community products, you know, let's say somebody has opened a library, somebody opened a little college or school somewhere, they this this come under in corporate social responsibility, or we call it CSR. CSR, yeah. A business, basically, a new business, for example, our new investor will think which company are CSR companies. Which companies have policy of corporate social responsibility? Because they think if they are in, if they are socially being socially responsible to public community, they'll also be socially responsible to us as well as investors. That's so correct. they become more sort of you know ethical in point in in the eyes of investors. Okay? So here we have. You see the difference here in accounting income and taxable income. As accounting income is a bit of economic measure because it's just like a budget, you know, we have budget, budget income, how much income we would receive. But on the other hand, taxable income is more objective because then it's close to cash flow. We can see exactly how much money we actually are going to get. Income tax accounting is all about obeying the law. Whatever the law says, we should pay for it. Tax does, law does not say we should pay more than we owe them. And definitely, we cannot pay less than, less than what we owe because then that will become illegal. So we should pay exactly what we owe. And taxes are not basically enforced. Tax, taxes are not voluntary. They are enforced exactions. So they are not voluntary contributions. So we should pay exactly what we owe them. So this is the end of the session today. Uh, is there any questions somebody has to ask? Any questions? You know? These are all about seeing people different, nice, nice. But I think so. Um... The whole uh, presentation was a bit uh, tough to observe uh, in a one go, but that's that's all about accounting. It's nothing uh, rocket science there. It's just that what we do it in a, in a normal practice, it's just to observe it, like I say, uh, follow the law thing, you know, um, and follow your instinct there, do the right things. I think so. Um, the difference which, uh, let me explain my point of view here uh, before we conclude, uh, Rahat Sahib. Is that uh, in Asian community, it's kind of we don't take accounting as a serious um, process. I always say accounting is a process; um, it's not a subject there. 
And uh, once you take this accounting as a serious process, then uh, like uh, Rahat went through different slides in the episode one or series one, and now uh, today in a series two, there's a lot of uh, things you could help uh, yourself inside the business. Like uh, the numbers have a strength. And once you have those numbers, or uh, in other words, once you have that data, you could utilize that data for your own benefit there to say what is working for you and what is not working for you. And then take up a positive out of those old data. Um, but if you haven't done your accounting practices and your accounting practices, whether you are small firm, whether it's a one man firm or whether it's a 500 people from there, I think so Asian people uh, from the Asian background, they don't take it uh, quite seriously. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Raj, sir. In my opinion, I agree with the Asian side, but I think it's not only Asians, so it's also everyone, even English, even, even Irish. Like, you know, we had a quotation in, in I think, in India or Pakistan, I know Delhi Duras. So I think mm. it's just that, you know, Delhi is too far away. Similarly, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to accounting, not many companies like to spend money in accounting. Uh, I saw the same trend in, in Ireland. I, got same, I see the same trend in the UK as well. Most companies, they spend more money in marketing and sales. They think, oh, sales are not important. I always had arguments with salespeople when I was working as French controller or, or group, group uh, counter or group uh, controller. I would tell my salespeople, it's rather, it's rather you sell five pounds and we know that we're going to get the money back instead of selling five to the pound, you never see the bills. Mm. Because sale is never complete until you collect the money. That's correct. So that's why we need to make sure that you know, we have, you know, this, this course basically is not designed for accountants. You know, I said before, it's, it's according fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So if you are head of the company, you could be director of a company, you could, you could be owner of the company, you could be entrepreneur who likes to start the business. You need to know, need to understand these things. These are simple terms which will make you aware of what's going on around you and then you can make the maybe understand things a lot better than before. Mm -hmm. So if you are maybe, you know, a lot of companies, they sort of send people in, in Middle East, some engineers, they will come to work in finance so they can understand their estimates, you know, because every time an engineer is working in project management, they need to understand the figures and costs mm -hmm. involved. If you don't understand, you know, what's the cost or like, how can, work, how can you work as a cost, you can really not get the job done properly. So this is basic information. I know it went a bit, bit dry at some stage because at, at the end of the day, of we, we discussed in the first lecture, we, we talked about, you know, a type of accounting, type mm -hmm. of accounting was four, in my opinion. They were bookkeeping, uh, they were financial accounting, which we covered last time, and today we covered about, you know, uh, uh, we call it uh, managerial accounting and taxable accounting. So I just had to go through exactly what taxable accounting was and what managerial accounting was. In the next session, third session, we'll go into more detail of you know financial reporting. You know, financial reporting will have the balance sheet, will have the income statement, and you know, uh, what the cash flow report. So we'll go through that in the next next term, hopefully. Sure. So, tell me, what's up before we conclude this live stream. For the young uh, people or uh, young students who want to start in the life of uh, as an accountant or take a career as an accountant, what is your message for them? In my opinion, look, you know, uh, first of all, Tasim, let me tell you a small story. Actually, I didn't plan to work in accounting. Mm -hmm. I uh, basically initially when I was in college in Pakistan, I was doing pre-medical, then I wanted to become a doctor, but then uh, you know, the way Pakistan, you can do one or two attempts. I didn't, I didn't achieve the retire, you know, required results. So I thought, okay, fine, let's do BSc. Uh, I had that biology in, 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 uh, in FSC, but then I went to do uh, BSc in mathematics. So I double maths instead. That BSc. was quite popular at that time. <laughs> yeah, quite popular. So at that time, you know, because, you know, at that time in, in our age, you know, at that time I went to BSc in mathematics. So our teacher who was teaching us mathematics, he was, he had a very sense, very dry sense of humor, maybe worse than even Irish sense of humor. He said to us, you know, anybody who had uh, not studied biology, raised your hands. It was four or four, five, four, five of us in the, and we raised hand. He said, okay, guys, consider your sex had changed. You have, be, you have been reading girls subject before. Now you're going to learn the boy subject. Mm -hmm. with, with biology, you can sit in the bed, put the quilt on top and you can study it. But you no, know, with math, math, mathematics, you had to sit on the chair and table. That's and correct. you can keep practicing, Tentive. practicing, otherwise you can't do it. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, I think accounting, actually, basically, I was uh, when I when I worked in in hotels in in UK, I was working in operations. And you know, one one night, one day, my GM said to me, "Rahat, I need your help tomorrow in accounts department." 
So at that time, I actually was doing my MBA, but I had not decided where to specialize. I was thinking of doing maybe specialization from Leicester University, either in uh, strategy or maybe something else, CRM or something. Uh, but then when I went to finance, I said, okay, no, no, hold on. I'm in finance now. Let's do accounting specialist in corporate finance. So my, my you know, style changed. And because of that, I selected financial subjects. Before that, I didn't have any financial background. So finance wasn't that difficult. Mm-hmm. I did my, you know, uh, let's say, last assignments, four assignments in 12 days. Mm-hmm. I was working with Jajir Mani. I only had four, uh, four, uh, 12 days given to me. My first two assignments were corporate finance. And second assignment was strategic financial management. Then I have to do my thesis, 15,000 words thesis, thesis proposal, and thesis as well, all in 12 days. Mm-hmm. So all of them, through my hard work, you know, I got A in all of them. So I had basically passed my MBA with distinction at the time. So it's, it's not basically hard. Accounting is not hard. It's basically you need to sort of practice all. Practice If you keep practicing accounting, you, are, you become more logical, you know, think logically, and then it's all easy peasy. It's not that hard, honestly. All right. So, so I think uh, basically, the, it's a simple message for any discipline is to work hard and have an aptitude for that. You should keep your open mind and you keep thinking logically. The according is all about logical thinking. That's all. all right. Thank you very much for today, um, live stream there. We'll see you next Friday, same time, uh, 6 Greenwich uh, Mean Time and 10 uh, Pakistan uh, Standard Time there. If you have any questions, please leave it into the comments there. And I will request uh, Mr. Rahat to answer your question, uh, whether it's related to accountancy, whether it's related to the accountancy career, anything in related to, in relation to that. You are more than welcome to, uh, to ask any questions there. Have a nice day, and we'll see you next uh, Friday, same time there. Yeah, take Thank care, everyone. Thanks to see you. Bye. Thank you for Thank having you. me there. Thank you. Thank you.